Come and play at Meerkat Manor in half an hour on BBC Two after we explore a spectacular, rugged landscape. At the very southwest tip of Britain lies an ancient land, wild, Cornwall, almost encircled by the sea, with an island feel and an island culture. A haven for all kinds of wildlife. Cornwall is part of England, yet remains a world apart. The coastline is so varied and there are so many different aspects to it crammed into one small area. The whole of Cornwall really is unique. If you speak to anybody who comes travelling down here for holidays, or has lived here, or moved here, they really do say Cornwall has something special. The ruggedness, the natural beauty, the wildlife, everything just works hand in hand. My favourite times in the summer are the very beginning and the very end. It's obviously a bit quieter then, um, but especially in May, the day's getting longer, um, the sea's getting warmer, the weather's getting nicer, and it's just a very positive time of year for us. The Land's End Peninsula, at the very western point of Cornwall, encounters the raw forces of the North Atlantic. Here, the pure air blasts in across thousands of miles of ocean, helping to carve out stunning granite cliffs. Secluded golden beaches. And wind-blown moors. There's hardly any woodland down here. Just a few trees cling on to the unforgiving rock. But in summer, this harsh landscape shows a softer side, and lying so far south and west, surrounded by the temperate sea, means that summer comes early to Cornwall. So the Cornish wildlife gets a head start. Roy Phillips has been enjoying the wildlife around the cliffs of West Cornwall since he was a boy. To sustain an interest through a whole lifetime, it's got to be something really special, hasn't it? You know, you've got to be able to go out every day with anticipation, excitement. What's going to be there today? Looking at the sea for birds, shall we say, you also have to look out for dolphins and, of course, the basking shark. And it's usually in early summer and start to come in May, then I think peak numbers are usually, in my case, what I've seen, about June. The basking sharks, they come right down here, right in here, you look down on them, and that, they open their great mouth, and this massive great gape, white lips they have, and you can see them just putting their head from side to side, taking up the plankton, and they're laser great things, huge they are. When the sharks arrive, it is one of the signs of summer, you know. You, you, you have the cuckoo in the spring and the flowers and this first flower, first, first of the other, but when the basking sharks arrive, especially in numbers, you can hope for a warm summer. Just like on land, the seas off Cornwall were warm before the rest of Britain, fueling a bloom of plankton that in turn attracts one of the ocean's biggest appetites. These giants, as long as a bus, sieve the water with their massive gills, filtering the equivalent of an Olympic swimming pool every hour.
As the summer advances, the plankton bloom moves further north, and the basking sharks leave too, departing Cornish shores to continue feeding off the Isle of Man and Scotland. The lure of Cornwall isn't just its wildlife. Miles and miles of glorious sandy beaches have made it a tourist hotspot. Until around a century ago, people came to Cornwall by boat. Today, though, fast roads mean that once the summer holidays begin, the beaches fill with people from all over Britain. And someone needs to keep an eye on them. I love coming to work every single day because, you know, just the scenery that, uh, that we've got around us and the, the surroundings, it's a great environment in which to work. It's probably the best office that anyone's got. It's very remote. And being a peninsula, you're on the north coast at one moment and then within sort of 20, 30 minutes, you can be on, on the south coast, on the west coast, you know, so it just offers a great sort of opportunity. I'm a qualified vet, and uh, during this year in particular, I've taken a career break um, to come. At, with, during that time, I'm working on the beach as a lifeguard. So obviously I've got the added interest in wildlife and my work as a vet certainly helps me if we do come across any wildlife incidents, that sort of thing. Occasionally the public will come to us and say, oh, we found a penguin on the water's edge that's essentially in some difficulty, but when you get there it's actually a guillemot because they're very small as well and they, they can be mistaken for a penguin by a lot of people. Occasionally through the monoculars you'll see something out to sea you'll think, gosh, that person's a long way out. When you get the binoculars on them, there's actually a seal out there. But, of course, with people with their wetsuits, um, a lot of people actually look like seals. <laughs> you have to just double-check. What I love about having people down on holiday, and even my own friends, is that they come to this part of the world and they they love it and it reminds you what you love about this part of the world as well because I guess you can get complacent when you live in one place for a while but when you see people coming down and enjoying what you're used to in your everyday life that makes me sort of really really proud of where I come from. <laughs> Even at the peak of summer, when towns fill up with visitors, the locals always know how to escape. Down here, instead of going for a walk, you get out on your boat. And that's how Harding Laity gets his bit of peace. Most of the small boats here are fishing for mackerel professionally and landing every day. Whereas um, I'm retired now, I, I've got a half share on this boat with, with Admiral Searle, my partner and uh, we go fishing and just go to enjoy it. Harding's on the trail of Cornwall's other summer visitors. Lined mackerel are very much in demand, you know, they really are and they sell well. They arrive, you know, for the summer and they're a summer fish. Mackerel shoals are pretty hefty around here. You know, they'll bite anything, they'll go for anything. Yeah, they're doing it full time and uh, they're out morning and evening and then they land to the market at Newley. And these mackerel will be sold tomorrow. You know, I mean, they're that fresh. Throw that away. Oh, come here. A big mackerel.
But there's always local competition. I had one follow me all the way up a couple of weeks ago. But there are one or two that come in the harbour and the boys throw them a mackerel and they'll get it before the gulls. Fantastic. Crab and lobster are a traditional Cornish catch. But fishing isn't the only industry this area is famous for. Chimney stacks dot the coastline, a relic of Cornwall's tin mining heyday. Since the last mine shut down, they've become a magnet for the tourists too. I'm an underground tour guide at Giva Mine, a mine which closed in 1990 and now of course is a, a heritage site. Tin mining in Cornwall goes back an awful long way. A lot of the side effects of mining obviously was the fact that it did poison a lot of ground. But the land does fight back and the wildlife is quite extraordinary now in this area. Adders, slow worms, lizards and buzzards. Of course one time buzzards were decried by farmers because they killed the game birds and things like that but nowadays we like to see them. Human history in Cornwall, though, goes back a lot further than tin mining. A lot of the field boundaries around here are older than the pyramids. And in actual fact, they are the oldest man-made prehistoric structures in the country, which still serve the same purpose today for that which they were built about 6,000 years ago. They're made out of dry stone, and that's because the fields were covered in these, and in order to clear the fields, they needed to get rid of the stone. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to grow any crops. So they built their boundary walls out of them. As summer starts to turn and harvest time approaches, it's a busy time down on the farm. Russell Osborne is the latest of three generations to raise cattle on this stretch of coastline. Summer time working, living here, Javalgan and along the coastline really is a special time of year because you can get up early in the morning and wander down and count your cattle and with a sea behind you and all the wildlife and birds are out early in the morning calling to one another. really gives you that buzz and drive and what you do it all for. There's lots of um, birds going around with a pair of peregrine falcons circling around in the air. The odd buzzard appears as well. There's one I call Bert, always comes around when it cut in silage, you sit at the gatepost for hours and hours on M1 in the fields working there and it'll just watch ready sort of field mice to appear. Also, there's lots and lots of rabbits around, which you know, our dogs enjoy to chase around as well. In fact, everyone seems to revel in this time of year. Cornwall has got a longer stretch of coast than any other English county, more than 320 miles, so it's natural for the Cornish to look to the sea. The Coast Watch organisation was set up when the official Coast Guard station closed down here and was set up by a group of volunteers. We monitor all the shipping 
that goes through here, between here and Land's End. And our main task really is to listen out for May Days and to watch the smaller vessels in particular, little local boats that haven't got the equipment on board. I first developed a special interest in dolphins and whales in 1992 when the pod of bottlenose dolphins turned up in this part of the coast. I looked out and there's a lovely silvery sea and suddenly it was broken by these series of big black fins come splashing and jumping by and I just fell for it. I've been interested in looking ever since and never regretted it. If there's no whales and dolphins or much else, there's always birds to see. Even if there's only gannets, hawks, fulmers, pittywakes, so always birds to see. Occasionally when I watch a gannet flying along, looking a little bit curious, flying quite low over the surface, it might sort of veer and turn a little bit and I get a bit suspicious then because quite often when I put my telescope onto it, I then pick up a porpoise or two beneath it. So it's, watch the birds, they know what's going on down there. If, if something going on, something chasing fish, the gannets will be, be there. Gannets have always been the fishermen's eyes over the ocean. For centuries, birds, dolphins, even whales, helped to reveal the location of fish. Every year, these predators would mass round the Cornish coast, feeding on huge shoals of pilchards, which arrived during the summer months. This heralded the start of the annual pilchard fishery, vital to towns like St Ives. Brian Stevens is the grandson of a Cornish pilchard fisherman. They would say that they saw a whale, and these whales used to accompany the fish. I have got records of one whale that came regular within two or three days each year. They were migrating up and down in their course, and they were following the shoals of fish. Upon the cliff top, there is a man who was called a hewer, and that man is going to look out for the fish. To locate the fish, the hewer had to look for signs, and there were many signs. And the most prominent one was gannets diving, because they knew that they were diving on fish. When there was a sighting of fish, and the cry was given of, Heather, Heather, and then the trumpet would be blown, and that would make a sound that would go out over the town, and that would be the alarm, that would be the hue and cry. And therefore, all would run, dropping whatever they were doing. The same boat has been out, and it has shut the net, and now it's inside the net. And the one in the stern there, he is the master seiner. He is the man who is uh, relaying the instructions from the hewer to the men aboard the boat. And all around this tuck net is the men in the boats dipping the fish out into the dippers. The men have got their oilskins on and the master seiner there, I fancy, is having a pasty. Cornwall's stunning scenery and solitude is made even more special by the magical quality of its light. Like everything here, it centres on the sea. Artists are drawn from all over the country to work here, but others are homegrown. Neil Pinkett was born and raised in the town of St Just, a stone's throw from Land's End. The light is just, I mean, it sounds such a cliche, but the light is quite amazing. Obviously, it's to do with having the sea on three sides, you're on a peninsula, and the, the light is bouncing off the sea as well as coming down from the sky, so there's just huge amounts of it. 
part of being in, in Cornwall is being aware of nature in the raw, because it is, I mean, there are no trees. And it's, you see things so readily, I mean, they become very apparent. Kestrels are very common down here, and they do a lot of hovering, watching for voles and mice. Strangely, also buzzards now, and I wonder if they've learnt that from the kestrels, <laughs> because they, you know, they have this bit where they're just sort of moving the wings like this, and then they're sort of trembling the wings like that, and you can just see all the the, the, the feather and the, the tail, sort of at the angle of it changing and the, a sort of ruddering into the into the wind. So much skill. Well, the sea is um, a very powerful element and I always think of it as an elemental force. For me it, it is one of the most beautiful and the most dangerous places there are. Every seaside community has people that have been lost to the sea and it just it just sort of instills a, a complete respect for the, the element of the sea. Try and capture that in, in paint is something I, I do sort of aim for really when I can. You see a lot of um, seals down here, but actually it's usually when the waves are a bit a bit as they are here today. In fact, I think I can see one down there now. They seem to have a lot of fun playing around in the waves, all that effervescence, all the oxygen, and they just seem to have a great time. And uh, there are quite a few down here. This furthest tip of the Cornish Peninsula is a stronghold for hundreds of grey seals. They haul out in the isolated bays where smugglers once rode ashore. The steepest coves, impossible to get to from above, provide a sanctuary for females to have their young. Grey seals give birth in September, right at the end of the Cornish summer. Just a few hours old, this pup will suckle on its mother's rich milk and triple its weight in the first three weeks of life. The pups are born snow white, a relic of our Ice Age past when camouflage would have protected them from predators. These early days are risky. After just 18 days of nurture, the mothers return to sea and leave their pups alone to face the full force of the Atlantic in autumn. It seems bad timing on the mother's part but seal pups are equipped to cope. They quickly learn to master underwater life, even as autumn storms begin to batter the Cornish coast. Seal pups store enough blubber to survive the first few months and give them time to learn the art of fishing for themselves. This baby fat is gradually converted into muscle and come spring, they'll be as agile as their parents. It's not just the seal pups who must brave the storms. This is a busy time for lifeboat crews around the Cornish coast. I work for the RNLI and the, the coxswain of the lifeboat here, and um, because of that, I'm rooted in the parish, uh, not allowed to go more than five minutes from the station. Now that the holiday season is relatively over, it, it's a great time to come here because very few people around, lovely fine day, breezy, but 
look at it. You know, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Gannets are weird because they always go that way. <laughs> and tomorrow they'll always be they'll be going that way again, but you've never seen them going that way. So I mean do they go that way in the night? I don't know. From a fishing point of view, if you see gannets going to, that's somewhere that really it could be very well worth going. Because there's usually big fish driving small fish to the surface and um, in the past, when, when we were mackerelling, we had massive, massive flocks of gannets going to and thousands of pilot whales in the water alongside the fishing boats. As the seas pick up after the summer calm, the crew are called out to search for a missing person. It's a dangerous job, but a deeply rooted part of Cornish life. It's a huge tradition, and I mean, it's an honor to be in it. That's the bottom line. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether you're pulling the wire down or whether you're driving the boat. It's, it's a huge honour to be in it, because you're in it for your village, you're in it for your community. Fortunately, this one was a false alarm. The crew arrives back safe and sound, but these seas can be treacherous. It is wild, it can be wild, yeah, but then that's the magic of it. Uh, when you get up in the morning and it's a screaming gale and uh, uh, the next day is lovely and quiet and sunny. Uh, that's, that's the magic of it. So as the wind and seas rise, autumn is now well and truly on the way. Some birds will leave these shores for winter, others will arrive. The seal pups need to grow up fast to make it through to spring. The locals tough it out all winter long, waiting for the next wild Cornish summer to begin. It's so much part of me being down here and being part of this piece of countryside is, is just so different and so special. It's stunning, yes, absolutely stunning. What better could you want? To speak to people who come down on holiday from wherever they are, be it this country or abroad even, they, everyone takes a piece of Cornwall home with them and take it all to heart. It's all about leadership and power next here on BBC Two in a double bill of Meerkat Manor. 